During the first century, most people around the Mediterranean Sea lived in densely packed cities, all ruled by the Roman Empire. Each city was a diverse blend of cultures, ethnicities, and religions. And because of this, there were all sorts of temples for offering sacrifices to all sorts of gods, and each person had their own portfolio of gods that they gave their allegiance to. But in every city, you'd also find a minority group who wouldn't worship any gods but their own. The Israelites, also known as the Jews, they claimed that their God was the one true creator and king of the world. Now all these cities were connected by a network of roads built by the Roman Empire, and so it was easy to move around, to do business, and even spread new ideas. Now one person familiar with these roads was the Apostle Paul. He spent the second half of his life traveling from city to city, announcing that Israel's God had appointed a new king over the nations. This king wasn't like anyone who'd come before. Right. Most kings rule with aggression or power, but this new king rules with self-sacrifice and love. His name is Jesus, and Paul is his herald, who's inviting all people to live under this king's rule. The stories of Paul's travels and how people received this message, that's what the third part of Acts is all about. For some time, Paul's home base had been in the city of Antioch. And from there, he and his co-workers went out on three road trips, traveling by land and by sea to strategic cities throughout the empire. In each city, Paul's custom was to go first to the Jewish synagogue where his people gathered. He'd start teaching and showing how the Messianic king promised in the Hebrew scriptures is Jesus of Nazareth. And some believed this news, others didn't, and still others thought this message was so misleading and dangerous, they would incite riots to kick Paul out of town. And so that's when Paul would take to the bustling city marketplace. He would set up shop there to make and sell leather tents to cover his travel expenses. And here, Paul kept sharing the news about the risen King Jesus with anybody who would listen. He was often misunderstood as just promoting a new God. One time he prayed for a sick person, they were healed, and everyone around thought he must be a Greek God that came down to visit them. But Paul insisted there's only one true God and he was his servant. This message often stirred up opposition and more riots, and he got beaten, even thrown in jail. Why such a strong reaction? Well, the worship of the gods held together Roman culture. They believed the gods kept their city safe, and the temple worship of the gods was a huge part of their economy. Paul wasn't just adding Jesus as a new god to the list, he was saying all other gods are powerless, even a sham. So he's undermining their way of life. Yes, and more than that. When Paul announced Jesus as a new king, he would call him Lord or Son of God, the very titles people used to refer to the emperor of Rome. So Paul's message could easily be heard as a threat against the entire political order. Why would anyone join this movement? I mean, it sounds dangerous. Well, people were captivated by the story of Jesus and how his love created communities where all people were treated as equals, regardless of ethnicity, gender, or economic status. These people formed new families that would eat together. They lived sacrificially and took care of their poor. They lived like Jesus actually was the king. Right. And so in every city where Paul announced the message about Jesus, people were being transformed by God's spirit to become new kinds of humans. So Paul would stay in that city and teach them the way of Jesus. And then he would leave for a new city. This was a difficult life. Paul had to endure a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. Yeah, and he did so because he believed that his own hardships were a reenactment of Jesus' suffering and death for others. He said it was God's own love that drove him to share the story of Jesus, no matter the cost. After his third road trip, Paul's reputation had grown. He had made many new friends, but had also made many new enemies that he would be wise to avoid. But Paul didn't avoid them. His next stop was Jerusalem, a city full of people who wanted him arrested, even dead. And so why he goes to Jerusalem and what happens when he gets there, that's what the final section of Acts is all about. Hey church, Pastor Kristen here. Happy Sunday and thanks for tuning in. I want to invite you today, if you've got your Bible or a journal on hand, to grab those now. Uh, send a text to a friend and let them know that you're watching and they can join you. And, and real quick, just since we're doing this, why don't you just, uh, in the chat right now, tell us if you had coffee or tea this morning. I'm so grateful that we're continuing to gather, even though it's online. And I'm excited about what the future 
holds. And I've loved this series that we've been in. We're going to close it in just a couple of weeks. This is our second to last week, and then we jump into something new. And uh, I've loved the Bible Project videos, right? What I love about them is that even as I'm watching the service, Nora and Hudson will come and watch that part with me because it's so engaging. And today, as we continue and kind of close up this series, this is our story. I wanted to just jump right into Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, I think that this is such a brilliant and beautiful uh, scripture. It's verses 22 through 24, and it's Paul talking. And he's addressing the elders there at the church, and here's what he says. He says, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Come on, is anybody grateful today for the good news of God's grace? If that's you, why don't you just put a hand up or an amen in the chat. I'm so grateful for the goodness of God. And today I'm preaching a message titled, Unmoved, Unmoved. Jot it down in your notes and in your journal. See, we're at the end of August already. Can you believe it? The end of August. And I don't know about you, but I started 2020 like, okay, this is the year of a tunnel vision. Anybody else? Like clear vision. It's 2020. We had to do it. It was perfect. Now I can see clearly, but man, has that been far from the case. 2020 has been wild. It's been crazy, so unexpected, but we all start the new year just pumped and ready. And it was so funny, I think just two weeks ago or so, there was this 2020 challenge out with these, it's a meme essentially about how each month has felt based on pictures. And I wanna throw up this picture for you. Look at this, this is Nora. And it's Nora's faces from January to September. Come on, where are my where are my February people, right? February happened and you're, we're like, what is going on? March, we're eating croissants. April, we've got self-care, but come on, it wasn't really working in April. By June, I mean, we are just throwing a tantrum. It's so bad. Uh, July is, I'm just gonna stay in my bathtub until the end of all of this. <laughs> August is, okay, what is the future looking like? And I love September. September is like, I'm excited about the future, but I'm also really unsure. Here we go. What is your 2020 mood? <laughs> I love all of these different pictures of Nora. And what I love about Nora is that she's got so many emotions, but I found in her personality, that uh, she's the kind of girl that if she wants to do something, she's gonna do it. But if she doesn't want to do it, she's not gonna do it. Like she's not really the kid that you can bribe with candy uh, to get the right photo for me. <laughs> she's not really, she's gotten to the point where the treats don't really work anymore. She's just got a resolve, you know, that she's not gonna move. Uh, unless you've really got something good for her. And both Nora and Hudson's personalities are, are amazingly strong and determined. <laughs> Even Hudson the other day, I said, Hudson, do you wanna help me clean? And he laughs, puts his head back, and he goes, nah, <laughs> one years old, telling his mom no already, pray for me. <laughs> I love it, they, they have these unmoved personalities. Unmoved, what does it mean to be? unmoved. It means not changed in one's purpose or intention. As we look at this scripture, Acts chapter 20, we see that Paul, he's just unmoved. He's unmoved. I love as we've read through Acts, if you've been on this Bible reading plan with us, you've seen at different times in his life, I mean, he, he was in prison and unmoved shipwrecked and unmoved. 
Hardships were facing him. Paul, he's, he's unmoved. Persecution, unmoved. Stoned nearly to death, they drag him out of the city thinking he was dead. Gets back up, walks into the city. Come on, that's a man who was unmoved. Unmoved, and I'm, I'm just wondering today, with everything happening in our world, with everything going on around us, what has you moved? Well, what's moving you when God is telling you to stay put? What opinions have you moved? What unknowns about the future are move, moving you and unsettling you? What fears are moving you? What financial hardship is moving you? I believe today, church, that God wants to get some resolve back in his people so that they'll rise up and say, we will not be moved. We're not going to be moved by what's going on around us. We know what God has ahead. We know that there is a race marked out for each and every one of us. And today I believe it's time for us to live unmoved. Unmoved, how do you live unmoved? We can look at Paul's life as we've opened up this scripture. And number one, we can live unmoved by fear of the future. Unmoved by the fear of the future. Paul, he says, I am going to Jerusalem, not even knowing what will happen to me there. He was unmoved by what was ahead. He knew that it was unknown. There was a lot of fear. He knew he, as he's talking, maybe that his life isn't going to uh, keep going as he goes back to Jerusalem. He had a fear of the future, but he was unmoved by it. I love, I love Paul's resolve. Have you ever gotten a song just completely stuck in your head? A song that just keeps playing and playing and playing and no matter what you do, you can't get it to stop. Taylor and I, over the last couple of weeks, actually really months, we have the Hamilton soundtrack just playing in our minds all day and all night. That work song, is always in our head <laughs> and it, it can be so annoying and frustrating and, and as i was thinking about this song that was stuck in my head and, and reading about this scripture I, I thought you know worry worry is like the same old song that gets stuck in my head have you ever been led and driven by worry it's like no matter what you do you just can't get it out of your head. Thinking about what tomorrow holds, thinking about what could happen, contemplating the what ifs, being, being dragged down by anxiety and fear and stress. Worry is just this soundtrack and it, and it doesn't stop, it goes where you go. I was reading Psalm 62 and it says this, I love David because David, he. He struggled with worry, he struggled with fear, but, but he used song to work himself through the pain or the difficulty he found himself in. In verses one and two, he says, truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense and I shall not be greatly moved. So he says, hey, there's a lot going on. His enemies were out to get him. He could have been worried about the future, but he says, I'm not gonna be greatly moved by this. He goes down a couple of verses in verses five and six, and he says again, my soul, wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He says it again, he is my defense. I shall not be moved. It's almost as, as David is writing and singing this song that he needs to go back and remind himself again through the midst of his trouble that he was not gonna be moved. 
He has a confidence the second time he sings it. He found a refrain. A refrain is, is like a, a part of a song that repeats itself. It's the chorus. It's the part that he couldn't get out of his head. And, and he went back to it again and again. And worry likes to be the refrain in our mind. Worry likes to take over the refrain in our heart, constantly playing the soundtrack of fear. But can I encourage somebody today that you need a new refrain? You need something that's stronger to go back to. Worry is a refrain, but listen to me, so is praise. Praise is a refrain that we can sing over our situation. Praise is something that we can declare over our city. Praise and asking and, and crying out to God, it opens doors, it opens our heart, and it gives us a new song to sing. How do you get a song out of your head? You sing a new song. And I believe today that it's time for some of us to start singing a new song for praise to push us forward when fear tries to hold us back. You need a new song today to live unmoved by fear of the future. Why don't you let praise be the new song of your heart? Replace worry and fear with declaring the goodness of our God. He is your rock. He is your salvation. He is your defense. You have nothing to fear when you place your hope in Jesus. He's everything. He's healer. He's restorer. Start to declare just the goodness of God over your life today. And sing a new song to God. So we live unmoved by fear of the future. But not only that, to live unmoved, we've got to be unmoved by the fight. Unmoved by the fight. Paul says that I know that in every city the Spirit warns me that prison and hardship face me. I think this is really interesting. The Spirit warns me, Paul says, that there's going to be a fight. But wait, let's just go back to the to verse 22, didn't we just say that the Spirit compelled Paul to go to Jerusalem? Paul, are, are you saying that the Holy Spirit actually leads us into a fight? <laughs> Come on, this is, this is really interesting, right? He says, oh, I'm compelled by the Spirit, and I know that when I go into a city, the Holy Spirit reminds me there's going to be hardship. A prison and, and different things might face me. You see, we like to fight the fight. Paul, he was unmoved by the fight. He said, I I'm, I've got a resolve that no matter where I go, I'm going to let the Spirit lead me, even if the Spirit leads me into trouble. You and I, in our American Christianity, we will leave that following Jesus magically makes everything better. But we don't want the fight. In fact, some of us, we think the fight is from the enemy. When Paul is telling us, no, the Holy Spirit led me to go here. Jesus, even Jesus was, was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. But here's the thing, we've got to let the Spirit pick the fight that we're going to fight. I think some of us today, we've picked a petty fight. Taylor and I, we, we can sometimes fight over dishes in the sink. Come on, any married couples know what I'm talking about? You fight over the trash not being taken out. You can fight over these small little things. Can we just be honest? In the moment, it's a big deal, but it's a petty fight. At the end of it, you think, why did we even go into that? It wasn't worth our time. It wasn't worth our energy. It was a petty fight. And, and I think some of us, we think we're in a battle today with the enemy, but we're the one who set the trap that we walk into. We've set the trap of drama. We've set the trap of, of gossip. And Paul, he's talking about prisons. He's talking about being stoned and persecuted. And you and I, 
In our 2020 culture, we think that a mean comment on Instagram is persecution. Come on! We, we want to be so moved by the struggle and moved by the fight and moved by what seems hard and difficult and like it's pushing back on, on us. Can, can we just agree today that maybe the Holy Spirit, He's got something on the other side of that prison, of that trouble, of that difficulty. You see, the Spirit led Paul into that prison, but the Spirit also led the walls to come crashing down as His prison praise was lifted up there. His his spirit led Paul and, and Silas to walk out freely. Come on, the spirit, it might lead us into hardship, but surely it'll lead us out. When we trust the Holy Spirit to pick the fights, we can fight the good fight of faith. You see, some of us were in a fight for our marriage, a fight for our children, our identity, We can think, God, how could you let this happen? I want to just encourage someone today, don't give up in the fight. Don't give up in the fight. The Holy Spirit is with you, leading you, compelling you to say, keep fighting for this. It's worth fighting for today. And sometimes, we're trying to fight our battles in ways that the Spirit never led us to. I think maybe it's time for some of us today to say, okay, I'm gonna get on my knees and I'm gonna fight this battle in prayer. I'm gonna call out to God. Just a couple weeks ago, we talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And, and some of you, you prayed for that gift. And I believe God, some of you, He already gave you that gift and filled you with that gift. But I wanna encourage you, don't quit praying for it if you haven't received it yet. There are prayers that God wants to pray through you. There are things that God wants to pray in you and through you to see those promises fulfilled in your life, to see the chains broken over your family, over your future. Continue to fight that fight in prayer. Paul, he shows us how to live unmoved. He was unmoved by fear of the future. He was unmoved by the fight that was ahead. And lastly, he was unmoved by self-fulfillment. He said, I consider my life worth nothing to me. He says, it, my life, it, it's, it's worth nothing to me. And let me just be clear, Paul, he's not suicidal. <laughs> he's simply saying that his life, when compared to what he's been called to, oh, it's, it's worth so little because the calling was so great. You see, this isn't about achieving Paul's dreams. And I'm concerned that this is where most of us find ourselves. We find ourselves really in, in, in this struggle. We're moved by self-fulfillment. I can't tell you how many people I talk to who make a decision to follow Jesus and love and serve God and they're on this journey, spiritual formation, and they're being discipled and then months later they get into a relationship with somebody who's not even a Christian, not even saved. And I challenge them and I say, hey, you, you don't want to align yourself with somebody who doesn't believe in the God that you believe in. And, and a lot of times these conversations don't go too well because people don't want to hear that. What do you mean? What do you mean I have to give up this relationship? And it's so interesting to me that we're so moved by our own desires that we would settle for less than God's best to fulfill ourselves. We find ourselves moved by our dreams. Most of the decisions that we make today aren't about God's will, but what will sustain us. We're moved by, by these different things. And, and Paul, he says, and I believe today that if you and I got this into our hearts and got this into our spirits, it would change our homes. It would change your life. It would change your city. 
if you would say my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. You see, Paul, he lived unmoved by all of these things because he was only moved by one thing. His eyes were set on the finish line. He said, I'm gonna keep running. I'm gonna keep fighting. I'm gonna keep going because I know that what God has ahead, oh, it's better than anything that's behind me. I'm gonna trust in his word. I'm gonna fight it out because I believe that what I'm fighting for today, it's worth it. What you're fighting for, it's worth it. You can live unmoved by whatever life throws at you if you can keep your eyes on the finish line. Saying, Jesus, I've got my eyes fixed on you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you. He looked at the finish line. For some of us today, we can be so challenged by the finish line. There's a great story about a man named John Stephen Aquari, and he was a marathon runner. And in 1968, he was at the Summer Olympics in Mexico City, and, and he was running the race, and he had just gotten started. When the path, it got a little bit smaller. Some of the racers were trying to get ahead of one another. And in this small part of the path, he was pushed so hard that he fell to the ground, dislocating his knee and completely hurting and ruining his shoulder. Even the, the doctors who came on site and looked at them, they said, oh, you, you've, gotta, you've gotta bow out. You can't continue to go through this race. You've gotta, You've got to stop. He said, oh, no, I'm going to keep going. So he kept going. And, and over an hour later, he finished the race. By that time, there was a medal ceremony going on. Nobody had their eyes on the finish line. People had left. They'd gone home. They'd forgotten about the race. In their minds, it was over. But in that moment, one little news company saw him running over the finish line and all of a sudden, all the attention was turned to John. And they said, John, why did you keep going? <laughs> They're looking at him limping, barely finishing the race. And this is what he said. My country did not send me 10,000 miles just to start the race. They sent me to finish the race. Listen today, it's not about how you start, but it's about how you finish. I wanna declare over someone's life today that God, he didn't send you to this earth at this time in history with all of your struggle and all of your heartache and all of your pain just to start the race and quit. No, he sent you to finish the race. He sent you to continue on the faith, to not give up on what he's called you to, on what he's promised you to. And I wanna be a people who declare that we're gonna be unmoved by everything and only moved by the finish line, which is Christ. Come on, wherever you are today, I wanna pray for you. Lord, I thank you for your people. I thank you, God that even in the midst of everything we're dealing with and everything we're going through, that you give us a resolve to say we're going to live unmoved. So today for your people, Lord, would you give them strength to choose praise, a new refrain over their life and over their situation. Lord, would you give your people today a new resolve to say, Lord, I'm not gonna keep fighting the petty fights, but I'm gonna fight the good fight of faith only that the Spirit leads me into. God, would you show them even in the spiritual realm, Lord, what you want them to pray for? Would we humble our hearts and fight the battles on our knees, Lord, for your people who are saying, God, I've been fulfilling myself and today I wanna say no longer am I gonna live a life that's only about me, serving me, but today, God, I humble myself. 
I say, Lord, I want to serve you and I want to know you. I'm going to be unmoved by self-fulfillment so that I can be moved by Jesus, the one you've called me to, to the finish line. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with us and said, God, I don't want to live for myself any longer. The Bible tells us that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that we become a new creation. So right now, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Just repeat it out loud if you can or just in your heart wherever you are. Say, Dear Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I repent. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my life and make me whole again. I give you everything. My past, my present. God, I even give you my future. All of me for all of you. You are the Lord of my life. I surrender to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Hey, right now our church, we are celebrating you. You can't hear it right now, but normally when we're in a room together, we are cheering and clapping and hugging you. And we're so excited about what God is doing in your life right there, in your car, in your kitchen, in your bathroom, in your bedroom right now. God's presence is with you. And if you prayed that prayer with us and you meant it, I want you to do a favor for me. Would you text Jesus, just one word, Jesus, to this number 646 713 2393. If you text that number, someone will reach back out to you immediately. We've got our team ready and waiting to respond. We're going to send you a, a free book with just some information and resources of, about what it really means to follow Jesus. But not only that, we're going to pray for you and we're going to walk alongside you. And I, I love for you to do that. Or if you're on the online site, you can click that button right there as well that says, today I decided to follow Jesus. We love you. We're celebrating you. Church, we're so grateful for you. Thanks for tuning in today. Week after week, 23 weeks, we've been online. You're amazing. Thank you for serving on Fridays with us for Heart for Harlem. Thanks for all that you do and that you give and the way that you serve. Man, God, uh, has so much ahead of us, and it's going to be a great week. I love you, and I'll see you soon.